Good evening. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. I was looking forward to this interview to hang out with you. Nice. Thank you for accepting my invitation. Not a problem at all. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Perfect. That's a great moment for us to talk about a little bit CBDCs and everything that is going on right now in this space. Absolutely. There's so much happening. It, it Just seeing where we're headed to right now and having an inclination or a yeah. belief based off of documents, it feels so good <laughs> to see where we're headed. Yeah, that's true. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate you about your channel. You always share like great content, uh, all based on research and documentation. That's a great thing to do. We lack this kind of information in our country. So that's why I started my channel like a few years ago. And now I'm trying to get some more perspectives outside of Brazil to yeah. uh, give to them. That's awesome. That's awesome. So how long have you been doing this now, running your channel? It's been about four years now. All right. That's awesome. Yeah. Check you out, man. <laughs> yeah, four years. And then um, I always see your content on Twitter as well. You share all the documentations along with other guys as well. So this is mm -hmm. very cool to see what people yeah. need to know what's going on behind the scenes. That's that's essentially the plan why I, I guess set my channel up the way I do YouTube and uh, Twitter, because yeah. I don't want to just give people information as if like I'm saying, trust me, bro. I'll give them the information directly from whoever the, you know, global head is the standard setting body ripple themselves and i'll provide a link as well that way yeah. people can take the information i provided and just take it and go further and continue to do your own research because the only way to find conviction in this industry is to continue to research if not then you're just one of those people on the sidelines crying and whining that xrp is 50 cents still why hasn't it moved i invest all my money in here meanwhile you haven't studied anything so you have no idea what's actually taking place in the industry. You're just here as a speculator to gamble. Yeah. And th that's not a way to do, you know, so that's awesome. Well, I have some questions that I would like to talk about in this conversation. And uh, I would just would like to listen to your perspective um, and see what you think. Right. For sure. In your view, what could the launch of RLUSD represent for the broader adoption of stable coins? How do you see regulations affecting the definition of assets that will remain in a new global financial system? That's a really good question. Uh, before I jump into that, I'll just let people know I go by the name Mr. Man. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on YouTube. Yes. Uh, on YouTube, you'll find me um, Mr. Man Crypto Talk. On Twitter, you'll find me at Mr. Man XRP. And I am typically on Twitter for most of the day or until about three, four o'clock ish central time. Then I take my break. But I provide information about Ripple because Ripple is one of the leaders in the uh, Web3 crypto ecosystem or ecosystem being built out and in terms of how they are, I guess, in, in a legal or regulatory battle or combat continuously, no matter what direction they take. So they are technically the leader in the space. And I talk about Ripple and as well as the uh, Unified Ledger and other ledgers creating this ecosystem that we are marching into. So to answer your question now about RLUSD and the regulations come down, I think Ripple's uh, really well positioned for it because state by state, there are regulations that allow for stable coins. Um, starting with New York, um, there's the NYDFS, the New York um, Digital Financial, I think Digital Financial System, I don't remember what it's called, but the NYDFS who provides the, um, the crypto asset issuer with the um license the money license and at one point xrp was on that license or ripple has the license and xrp was on that green light um list that ripple that um nydfs has for legal coins to be utilized within the state of new york and they there are other states i believe 50 states also have their own um replication of that that license as well the bit license and they make they make it and market it for their state specifically and ripple has 50 of them as well as singapore europe and a few others so with rlusd going live sometime soon and mika going live um december 30th 
And in March 2025, March 10th, 2025, Fed Wire will be going live, which is the Fed's jurisdictional, cross-border jurisdictional. So from Canada to U.S. or from U.S. to Brazil, payment system, Ripple, uh, Ripple's stablecoin, RLUSD, can be positioned already to be used. So with Ripple adhering to policy framework and guidelines already they're in a good in a good position to capitalize and begin to increase their market share with the, through their stable coin in their ecosystem ripple nets i hope i didn't that wasn't confusing no you're you're fine okay. I, <laughs> yeah no it's a lot of information and all these documents are so dense right for you to be able to grab all the information and put all the things together it's a work and that's why i'm bringing you here because you are a researcher that has been doing this for quite a long time and sometimes people ask me oh jessica where do you find this information and i will remember the documentation from like 2019 where mm -hmm. i saw that information so i pull up the information <laughs> it's just crazy <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It is it is. Like there are days I find it difficult to like post snippets of uh YouTube videos or even Twitter videos and documents, documents especially because you have to have a write-up behind it because not many people can read a regulation and understand what's it talking about what it's actually talking about and then determine how a company is is adhering to that particular regulation or that document itself or how the puzzles can fit together really. Yeah, it's a very hard job to do because if you're not aware of one word can mean things differently in different perspectives. So Absolutely. you get to be able to understand what the document is saying. So the second question I have for you is new technologies such as tap to pay in iOS 18 utilizing a ledger. So I saw one video that you shared about this information. That's why I'm asking, because I would like to understand your perspective on it. What is your opinion on the fact that most consumers who use these technologies are unaware of how they work and that they can still invest in the key asset behind the innovation? I think it's a neat situation because when I first jumped, not when I first jumped into this, but as I started deep diving into this industry and learning about it, and had watched videos and conferences and read PDFs talking about that these, like this is this is the generation that we're in right now. We will be one of the last generations to know and understand how this ecosystem is actually built and taking place. Because once the convolution and confusion of all these other industry, uh, like businesses and companies and corporations begin to flood the market with their thing, to find the core infrastructure that we're dabbling into is gonna be really, really tough. So something like Interledger, I, th I thought is really important when you asked me that question initially, because in Ripple, it's early days, 2013, I believe it was, there was uh, individuals from Google, Fisker, Apple itself that was working in Ripple. They came from uh, came from those um, other, other uh, businesses to work at Ripple. So to see Interledger being implemented for tap to pay now, I can just tap my phone on somebody else's and transfer funds. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I can see that Google is stepping in as well. But Google's been there from the beginning also. And but now they're pretty much ready for you know, mainstream, if you will. Because I posted, I want to say a month ago, that Google stepping in uh, in the fact of working with uh, India and what they're doing to get into India itself, not, not having to go def, uh, directly to the RBI, Reserve Bank of India. What they're doing is a workaround and going into but uh, Bhutan because Bhutan's currency, digital currency, um, is backed by... Um, india's digital rupee or india's rupee itself and ripple is creating that cbdc so for that cbdc to contain the digital rupee india's digital currency already that's a good segue to get into the indian market there's also the icic bank uh yes bank and a few other banks in india as well who are capitalizing on ripple net so that network effect between those those companies and banks within um india when RippleNet takes off, 
and their stable coin can be utilized globally, I think it'll be wonderful to watch. Very, very wonderful to watch. And people will have no idea that they can just tap and the, the technology that's actually behind that tap. You know, you and I know, your audience yeah. knows, my audience knows, and the people watching know, which is fantastic. But majority of the people, unfortunately, will just never know. They just want to go and tap, tap, tap. And that's right. it. It's it's just like the rise of the internet itself, mm -hmm. the 2000s, right? People don't know how it works behind the scenes, like in the back end, but you can just tap a message and send an email to the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. It will be basically the same concept with digital assets. Yeah, yeah. And I've heard it say from uh, Wellington Scully, he's uh, an individual at Ripple, that you need an asset that is likened to the uh, protocol TCIP, which is the standard internet protocol. So if Interledger can be compared to the standard internet protocol for moving value, then it makes sense to have uh, companies like Apple and Google utilize it and capitalize on it to move whatever value it is they're moving. Yes. Yes. And I like when you talk about inner ledger because some people are missing out the real meaning of decentralization, right? Because inner, inner ledger is actually doing that for other blockchains and, and networks. Mm -hmm. they, Absolutely. They, they are doing things like very quietly, right? Mm -hmm. No one talks too much about it and the developments are happening behind the scenes. So it's, it's funny you say that because I've had conversation with people and they were in the industry, not industry, but like they're in the different communities. Even uh, journalists who have stated on my um, some of my posts, stating that Interledger is a dead, it's a is a dead project, it's a dead protocol. And it's like, are you looking at the same thing I'm looking at? Because I clearly just posted this relevant piece of information from like a couple of days ago. So it's very, very relevant. It's very, very present and now. Yeah, it is. That moment, I told you so, will come for us that study this stuff, you know, <laughs> because it's like years and years of planning and developments and research. I think in a couple months, we will see huge things coming up. We can already see that, you know, all the things going on throughout the world, war and censorship, all things are contributing to the outcome. Yeah, yeah. If I can add to that too. So as you're talking about war and the different things that can play so for instance, other potential blocks and ones. There's the monkeypox. There's the COVID virus p coming up again. There's anthrax now. There is the uh, hoof and mouth disease. There's a bunch of cyber attacks. There are solar flares. There's yeah. so many things just compounding now that eventually something will stick to the wall and this will be the new boogeyman or a couple things will stick to the wall and we'll get that black swan that we are inevitably waiting for you know it's it's a it's a bad thing for our world essentially uh for society but in terms of financial investments unfortunately it's a positive thing for a financial investment though yeah exactly and that's the point you know that's the i don't like to say this word because it's kind of like cliche but that's the key point that's the turn key moment because at the same time that you have something bad going on some people will benefit from it you know mm -hmm. but we will only benefit from it because we saw it coming absolutely right absolutely. and um, that's the only way we can actually help others after all you know so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I continue i continuously find myself talking about this to um uh, a few of my friends now i started off trying to talk about it with a lot of my friends and i just became that guy that people stopped listening to <laughs> unfortunately because Me i wasn't too. relevant i'm the to same one. you too i'm just a crazy one in a circle <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I became irrelevant to what they were watching and, or listening to. They would talk about movies they watched. I'm like, I don't know what that is. They were talking about music. I don't know what song this is or even who that artist is or what these people did on a week. I have no idea. But if you want to talk about industry, making money, learn how to preserve your wealth, learn how to preserve yourself, learn how to not be 
as dependent on this financial ecosystem by claiming a piece of it yourself by all means i'm your guy you know yeah i can i can relate to that because i'm the same you know everyone that is all the time researching something trying to see what's going on behind the scenes they're different you know i'm not trying to be like oh better than anybody else but uh it's just something that happens we are just focused on making money and just trying to figure out all this shift that is uh currently going on Mm hmm. Mm hmm. If you don't mind me asking, when did you first get into, uh, I guess, find yourself in the crypto industry? It was 2018. It was right after the first, not the first, well, I think it was the second one, but the biggest bull run, right? Okay. It was 2017 to 18. It was right after that. Man, that's nice. I jumped in in 20, like I, I heard about Bitcoin when it first came out, legit 20, 2008. And I had no idea what it was. Digital money made sense to me. I'm like, we're already here already. I'm tapping my debit co my debit card in Canada. Mm -hmm. So it just made sense. Um, I didn't understand how Bitcoin made sense. I was following this group of individuals who were trying to teach like anybody in that group, but they were so far beyond what I was trying to comprehend. I was like, this is just way too confusing. It's not for me. And I put it off for like many years. Um, then the whole... C virus came around and I want to say that inject injected life into me. I wouldn't take, I wasn't one of those people that had taken any of those, you know, injections, but that had, I guess, gotten, gotten me down the um, rabbit holes of researching into those injections and into the, um, I want to say the, uh, the, 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 the behind the scenes of what the government actually does and who they are and who they claim to be. And in the World Economic Forum, IMF, I began to BlackRock. I began to learn about names I had never heard about before. And I jumped in in the 2020 bull run um, into 2021, and I got my butt handed to me because I didn't know what I was doing. My, <laughs> this, is, this is just some, I guess, some authenticity for you. I was managing my sister's, my cousin's, my mother's funds, and my funds at this point. And my sister and cousin had gotten to talking and suggested, why don't we put it in Bitcoin? People are making money. So when I jumped in and put the money in there, I watched it just decrease. And I was like, what the, what, what is, like, what's actually going on right now? I have no idea. I just saw the money that we had begin to dwindle away. And I started reading, reading news about Bitcoin and looking for anything that made sense. And all I got was news about Bitcoin and hoping and praying that one day retail will adopt it. And that model just didn't make sense to me. So with the frustration of the C-19 virus itself, I had a mental breakdown at work one day and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I just, I can't, I can't read about this stuff. It's just, it's too negative in my mind. It's causing my psyche to not be leveled. I was imbalanced. And I was like, you know what, for whatever reason, I'll take on cryptocurrency again. Let me learn, <laughs> learn a bit about it. So I had followed some accounts like influencers to start off with. And um, some of the influencers I had followed weren't the actual influencer account. They were those scam accounts that I'm sure you come across and see. Oh, but I didn't yeah. Know. Everyone that, got in, that uh, gets into crypto just uh, for some reason... Uh, we we are like subject to it, you know, mm -hmm. there are a bunch of them here. So I had followed them. They had said that, you know what, follow me. I'll teach you. I'll show you how to do how, how to do crypto. And I was like, uh, OK, here's how, what do I do with this money? And they showed me how to do this, do that. And they were like, now send it to this address. Gone. Money was gone. <laughs> Just like that. I had been like I had been in my early years been scammed out of like thousands you know like hundreds of thousands and it was terrible to the point where i had a mental breakdown again and i was like this is stupid why am i doing this and my wife is like you know what mr man you are a smart person you were a youth worker for a good chunk of your life 12 years of your life i came from the the field helping individuals with, with autism and asperger's dual diagnosis fasd so that's my background from where i did for 12 years and I had just recently graduated from aviation management on the dean's list, one of the top of my class. Myself, my other colleague, her and I were the top of the class. And I didn't have a background in studying. I didn't have a background in aviation. I knew nothing about that. But my motivation was I either learn what I need to learn now 
or I'm going back to where I came from because it's much easier, but I don't like being there. I don't like that guy who's back there. So I took that same mentality and my wife is like, you know what? You're the best researcher I know. So when I dove into crypto, I dove in head first and I still have not come up for air because I, I have nothing but pure intentions of coming out of this thing successful from this. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because, um, like your vibe attracts your tribe, right? My husband also says that to me. And um, when we put our time into, do, um, into doing something good for the world, um, it's, all, it's all good, you know, because we are like giving back to people, but at the same time, we are trying to evolve. And in this journey, mm -hmm. I, I know that I grew so much and I learned so much as well. And um, yeah, that's that's it. All all investors have kind of the same uh, path, right? Crypto investors, mm -hmm. right? Because it's it's a it's a very um, challenging journey. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the things I had learned, or I'm learning, and had watched a couple of videos that verified my learning, what I'm learning right now, is that the ones who come out successful are the ones who are willing to fail who are willing to put themselves out there to see what it's like and then fail and then say, no, nope, I'm not accepting this failure and then push past that and then to keep learning and keep learning and keep learning. Because if you get into this industry and then just stop, that's as far as you're going to get. Meanwhile, there's an entire ecosystem being built, an entire world taking place beyond the entry of crypto. Yes. It's just a matter of patience, right? Because most mm -hmm. people are not patient at all, but... Yeah. You have a little bit of patience. Um, I think you can succeed in this market. As I it agree. happened in 2018, as it happened in 2020 to, uh, to 21, and it will happen again in a couple of months. It's just Absolutely. a game. <laughs> just waiting. I'm here holding on with you. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but good to know about your story. It's good to know. Um, so I have this, the third question, if you allow me to ask. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah. So Ripple has been developing revolutionary technology for over 10 years while strengthening relationships with regulators around the world. In your opinion, what could the outcome of the events we have seen unfolding this year, considering Ripple, uh, unique stat status among blockchains, like what could that this lead us to? So what I'm picturing, as I've read some G20 documents, some T20 documents, T20 is the G20's think tank. As I listen to the Russian Federation and uh, Indian government as well, um, I try to keep myself diversified. But what I think is going to happen, like it's just it's, we're going to be experiencing or be in a world where, where there's a harmonized ledger or unified ledgers and shared ledgers. So the difference between a unified ledger and a shared ledger, a unified ledger will contain different mechanisms, different moving parts, different crypto assets, providing different um, use cases. Uh, so, for instance, a unified ledger, which I had spoken about, um, would be uh, one of the RTGS real-time growth settlement systems, which I, I read that the BIS was talking about, I believe it was, where where sorry it was amazon it was an amazon amazon web service and they had the xrp ledger as the main or first um layer or first uh ledger to be used and then from there you have the messaging service such as axlr so when you get a message on your phone a text message that's a messaging service going back to you when someone sends you money you got a messaging service a message right on your cell phone that says you received money that's how Axelar fits in there. They have a messaging service. Then you have something like um, um, Cosmos, Cosmos ecosystem, which allows for bridging and changing from one blockchain to another blockchain, I guess is the word, using the IBC, the inner, inner blockchain communication to be able to communicate from one to the next. So with that communication, there is the bridges that are used. So one such as Corium, and Corium allows for the continuation of the of XRP itself. Corium allows for it to leave from the XRP ledger to from Corium to the interface of Sologenic back out to Corium itself. And in there, you might find at the end mechanism, you might find something like uh, Polkadot. 
And Polkadot offers parachain, which is just time frame or time limited contracts. So for instance, for that immediate transfer of funds, if I have two bank accounts and I send myself one uh, funds from one bank account, I'll receive that notification already. But in that transfer of funds, there's a contract that happens from this account to this account for that finite three to five seconds, because if that money's lost, who do you go to? So okay. there's, that's what these parachains are for a finite amount of time for the contract. Okay. Well, I have a question regarding this that you just said. Where Cosmos, the Cosmos ecosystem, have a, a link with this path that XRP Ledger, Corium, Sologenic go to the other tokens? Because I see that the ERC20 tokens are still nowadays are the standard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And for, for Ripple to be able to communicate with, for example, uh, other Ethereum tokens, it will need the, the cosmos ecosystem right I, if i'm not mistaken because i know like fundamental but i don't know too much the technical part of it <laughs> yeah no you're actually correct with uh Pierces, Pierces is working on one of the evms uh right now sidechain there was actually a block star interview with the ceo of Pierces and david schwartz where they were talking about the architecture of the actual um bridge or evm sidechain whatever you want to call it which will consist of the EVM. It will consist of um, Tendermint, which is Cosmos. It'll have ETHMint, which is a combination of Ethereum and Tendermint. And they were looking at using Polkadot, but Polkadot wasn't able to scale to the, to the length that they wanted to. So they ended up using, for, uh, using Cosmos because Cosmos can scale. And this bridge that they're building or sidechain will operate seamlessly, as they put it, with the XRP ledger and on that bridge that they're creating or um, sidechain, XRP is the main token itself. So when you're using these XRP ledger, you'll have XRP there. And then to bridge over to Ethereum using the ERC standard, you'll have XRP over there too, until you finally get to the actual Ethereum platform. And at that point, you know, you'll be using ETH, you know, the ERC. So yeah. if you're moving value such as RLUSD from XRP ledger, through that bridge itself onto ERC, then you're still within the Ripple ecosystem on Ethereum. So yeah. I think it'll there'll be like awesome benefits going into the future for Ripple for individuals holding um, XRP and any of these other crypto assets that are that are making a part of this regulatory unified ledger or unified ledgers, I should, should say. Ledgers, right? That's why I keep saying to my students, my audience that it will be interoperable. The fact that we only talk about XRP and Ripple doesn't mean that only exists Ripple and XRP. You know, it's mm -hmm. an ecosystem. Uh, it will be interoperable. And uh, the inner ledger will actually play a like a huge role on this new financial system. So yeah, interoperability is a word. That's, that's, that's that. <laughs> Well said. Right? Yeah. So thank you for answering this question. And then now the fourth and last question is why do you think retail investors have had and still have the chance to acquire the native asset of a network that is transforming the concept of the internet? With the rise of internet or the internet of value, why is an asset originally designed for large institutions still accessible to everyday citizens like you and me? That's a good question. And I thought about it for a while to come to like a, a reasonable answer. And I don't think it's never going to be a, like never. It's not going to stop being available to us. It's just once it's it achieves its use case and it begins to scale up, um, it'll still be available to retail investors. But will they be able to afford it at that point in life, though? Right. Mm -hmm. So it'll still be available. Just will you be able to afford it? So hypothetically, it reaches $20 and you need to hold 10 XRP now in your wallet. Can a certain person afford that uh, that $200 now to hold those 10 XRP in their wallet and not even use that XRP? That's just reserve itself, yes. you know? Makes so sense. seeing something like that also has me now at my newest, not argument, but my newest arguing situation i could say that rlusd will also be or follow a similar um framework i would say 
for to create stability with an RLUSD, I believe there has to be um, a, um, a certain amount held, held, which keeps uh, and creates stability within the asset itself, because this is a wholesale market. Now we're talking, we're not talking retail market where you and me are moving, you know, billions of dollars for this asset to be fixed and level and paired so with retail there, we usually get the variable fluctuations in the market itself in terms of what that asset is valued at with wholesale they will get the fixed value of it because they hold larger quantities of it which creates stability in that um think of it like buying a house where you can choose between variable and fixed on your interest rates for myself as an investor i tend to go with variable depending on what the what part of the cycle we're at in real estate in this economy right now should i choose to purchase i would per i would go in for fixed for a certain amount a uh, certain time for a period of time like one to two years just based off of the information i have and then i know that the rates are going to be dropping to x amount I will refinance again in Canada. We have to refinance every couple of years, every five years, with which is what's known as maturity. But I would only lock in for two years, go back, refinance, and as it's going down, I would go back. I would switch over to variable because I have more option as a retail investor in real estate because now I can just follow that market as opposed to locking in at a higher rate. Yeah, Tim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It makes sense actually, because people keep asking like, what would the, the, the affordability of this asset be for the, the retail investors? First of all, XRP wasn't meant to retail investors, right? Mm -hmm. So just for the fact that we can actually today buy this asset, it should be something that we could just say, oh, thank you, because we can buy it now. But I, we yeah. know that it wasn't meant for retail. That's something that keeps going on and on on Twitter forever. People keep engaging this subject. I've been in conversations with people where they're like, where they're saying, you know, F Gary Gensler, I can't believe this happened. If the lawsuit wasn't here, I'd be rich. If this didn't happen, if that didn't happen, at the end of the day, things happen the way they were meant to happen, regardless of anybody else's disposition in life. But because of the way it happened, it provided me, and I'm sure hundreds of others, if not thousands of others, the opportunity to get in and buy at lower, because I didn't even hear about XRP. So should it have taken off in 2017, 2018, while well, you were in there, you would have experienced it, and you and I wouldn't be having this meeting at all right now, because I would have been left behind. But thankful for the SEC and uh, Jay Clayton, Gary Gensler doing what they are doing, I'm able to buy then and I'm able to buy now, still, currently. Yeah. Today, I think XRP is 52 cents ranging, right? So this this meeting right here will be <laughs> will be in history a couple uh, years from now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. that we could buy xrp at 52 cents uh so actually i have one more question because i saw mm -hmm. one interview on your channel peter theo right in a recent in interview mentioned that he is no longer as excited about bitcoin questioning whether it still reflects the ideology of freedom from the state how do you view Bitcoin's role in the face uh, of increasingly strict global regulations? With more ETFs being approved, is there a risk of centralization falling into the hands of a few institutions like BlackRock? Because it's kind of going to the opposite way, right? They want it to be like Bitcoin freedom, but now the biggest institutions are holding large amounts of Bitcoin. So how mm -hmm. do you... Mm -hmm. I've seen an interview with Chris uh, Larson. I've seen some of Brad Garlinghouse, uh, David Schwartz, and a few other individuals. It might sound biased because they're all from Ripple, but they're talking about the uh, centralization of uh, miners in China. If miners continue to be to to, send, to 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 continue to grow centrally, in terms of uh, we've reached the halving now, so the Bitcoin uh, fees or payout, as, as, in a sense, will not be the same. It's half of what it used to be now. So for you to keep operating and mining Bitcoin, you have to continuously upgrade your, upgrade your systems and your hardwares to be able to be sustainable. But to do that, it costs more money because these new um, graphics cards are costing a lot more money and it's difficult in a high inflationary economy. So 
you're going to see a lot of these mom and pops mining, uh, like the you and me of the world falling off, can't afford it. You're going to see mergers. You're going to see acquisitions. You're going to see the centralization of miners at this point. So with Bitcoin now, Bitcoin itself, the asset aside from mining, centralization is also happening there too. Uh, because you, like you were saying, you have individuals such as BlackRock buying and holding and having to custody and segregate um, um, segregate accounts, their Bitcoin holding itself to be able to create this derivative ETF for other investors to purchase. My buddy actually holds some and we were talking about it today. And he's like, man, I got into Bitcoin. I was like, well, what, how did you get in? And he showed me his... Um, that he bought in through who was it? it was a Van Eck, Big um, BlackRock, or one of them? It was one Big of scale. them. One of them, yeah. Yeah. One and of I them. told, and I told him, I'm like, uh, you don't actually hold Bitcoin, you know? He's like, yeah, I do. He's like, I bought it. I'm like, well, <laughs> technically, you have a Bitcoin, technically, but it's not like you don't hold it. I'm like, in this industry, the saying is, you're not your keys, not your crypto. You don't own that Bitcoin. BlackRock does, or whoever it does, is does, and you own the paper of that Bitcoin they had put out so you could buy the ETF. So you're you're basically just, you bought the, you bought into this fund to go off the volatility of Bitcoin, essentially. Yeah. It just, it matches it. Oh my God, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, sorry, I'm sorry you don't hold it. <laughs> So, and then when I, when I think of Bitcoin back in the day as a decentralized finance and as money to be changed back and forth, you know, from peer to peer, as it says in the Satoshi white paper, I don't see that as the reality nowadays in 2024. And you can see that that centralization begin to tighten in 2020, late 2023, early 2024, when all these ETFs came into um, reality at this point, you know, Bitcoin has been given a pass through many things because it's decentralized. However, technically speaking, it doesn't meet necessarily meet, and I use the word necessarily very strategically, it doesn't necessarily meet regulations for the green agenda, unless Bitcoin or someone decides to make, to mine Bitcoin in a green manner or in an alternative manner to how they're mining it now and being able to use Bitcoin in a green manner because Bitcoin is unable to keep up with current fees. I mean, able, able to keep up with current uh, transactions per second in terms of scaling. It is what it is on the network itself. So if you were to build on top of that network, it's already operating at a slow pace. So your fast thing like the Lightning Network will or potentially feel and experience a lot of issues, a lot of backdoor um, hacks, a lot of negativity even though it might function and appear to function great but there's also a version of uh bitcoin light ne uh, lightning network on stellar you can also go bitcoin on the xrp ledger um so it's for a decentralized thing you can still get it on these decentralized ledger for something that's becoming more and more centralized gotcha yeah okay yeah, it makes sense because we see more and more Bitcoin mining companies migrating, for example, to Texas where the energy is cheaper so they can mm -hmm. profit more. That makes I've sense. Heard of, I've heard of several companies leaving the U.S. I don't remember their names because I'm not big into miners, but oh. several companies leaving the U.S. to go to Argentina because the price for um, energy out there is like three quarter of the price. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not. Yeah, the, Sorry, the like exchange quarter, rate is, it helps, right? yeah so i appreciate your perspective thank you for accepting my invitation i think this conversation will be uh, very insightful for many people who will watch this and uh, i appreciate it so if you want to put your information where people can find you one more one more time i'm gonna leave all the information in the description below okay perfect thank you so much i do hope i wasn't speaking too like too out of place at a high level kind of thing because I, I i thought i could bring it down to make it simple to understand because i know and understand that there are new people coming in this industry and wanting to learn about it and don't know who to follow um so i'm trying to make it 
more plain English to understand and to follow. So I hope I was able to accomplish no, that. No, you did, you did great. Thank you. It was very easy to understand. I think I'm sure people will love to to hear from you. So okay, thank you. So if you're looking to get a hold of me again for anybody else out there, uh, my name is I go by the name Mr. Man on Twitter. That's at Mr. Man XRP. On YouTube, you can find me at Mr. Man Crypto Talk. Um, I'm typically on Twitter for a good chunk of the day. I do that as my working job now. I would guess you could call that to put out research and information. I don't call myself an influencer. I'm a yeah, researcher. No, answer, researcher, right? Exactly. So I put out information that I find and it's based off of the best hypothesis from my understanding of what I've read and can comprehend of what's going on in the industry. A researcher, not an influencer. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Man. Um, I'm sure this class, it's a class because you're talking about like technical stuff and people will love this. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And we can talk next time. We can definitely schedule something uh, if the subject comes up. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for having me. Uh, you can't see it, but I am smiling under the mask though. I do. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> That's, that's I so do funny. appreciate you having me on here. You know, I, I look forward to doing it again should you decide to have me back on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. See you next time. Take care, Jessica. Take care. Bye.